Today, we will explore degrowth. What is growth? The general increase in production and consumption over a given period of time, typically measured as the annual increase in gross domestic product, GDP, the world's most strategic indicators, but also one of its uh, most uh, problematic ones. But it's only later in the 50s and 60s that the United Nations and the World Bank pushed every country to use it as a measure of the health of their economies. So growth became a very specific way of defining what a good society is of, or what a good economy is. This idea is based on the ideological belief that more market exchange means that more human needs are met. It says nothing about equity, about the distributional aspects uh, of growth, who gets what, who doesn't. It says nothing about the quality of growth, right? Whether it's like useful things or... And it can only see priced activities. So you can see on the figure here that ecological processes, unpaid work, such as caring activities, are completely left out of the picture. And so GDP only sees a very small part, right, of what is truly important to reproduce a society. The entire maintenance economy is made invisible through uh, this uh, indicator. Why does growth occur in the first place? Is it because of population growth? Not really, because growth increases faster than population. Is it because we naturally want more stuff? Not really either, because there was little growth before the 19th century, so... It's not a permanent feature of human societies because it boosts well-being. Or is it because of capitalism? They have to please the shareholders and they have to grow, otherwise the shareholders will go somewhere else. Because of debt and the generalization of indebtedness within capitalism also. Debtor, they have to grow because they have not only to pay back what they like borrowed, but also pay interest on top of it. So it's like an inbuilt mechanism that pushes the growth. Third point, the most important, because growth pacifies class struggle. It promises a, a better future for all, right? It's a great ideological device to deter people from demanding a fairer distribution of resources. Don't worry, we're growing. Just wait, things will improve. What's wrong with growth? Doesn't growth benefit everyone as it takes place? Here on the figure, the wine would symbolize the additional growth, right? Starting from capitalist entrepreneurs and trickling down to all wage laborers. Well, in reality, it looks more uh, like this, where a lot of wealth is being wasted and where lower glasses or lower classes don't get much and are ready to burst, basically. Let's look at it a bit more scientifically. David Woodward did the maths. He calculated that assuming constant high growth rates, we would need about 100 years to get everyone at a daily income of $1.25. And we would need about 200 years to get everyone at $5, everything else remaining the same. Even more striking, for $5 a day, we would need to grow the global economy 175 times, which is basically a, a biophysical impossibility. Business as usual and just standard trickle-down growth doesn't seem to be an option. Do economies like naturally go through different stages, difficult stages, maybe increasing ecological degradation or inequality, before then, after a certain point, being able to take care of all the mess when, they, when, when they've grown enough? There's not much evidence for that. Inequality and ecological degradation continue to increase as growth takes place. Can green growth take place instead? Right? Meaning, can growth decouple from the use of resources? Or can growth like dematerialize? Again, there is unfortunately uh, little evidence for that. No country has experienced an absolute reduction in material use while growing. So does growth lead to well-being at least? And yes, I would say, but only uh, up to a certain point, after which it starts to become counterproductive. GDP increases very neatly over the years, while the average life satisfaction stagnates, if not uh, decreases. Growth decouples from subjective well-being. Easterlin says, my results, along with mounting evidence from other studies, do, on balance, undermine the view that a focus on economic growth is in the best interest of society. How about poor countries, you will ask? Layard, another world expert in happiness studies, is pretty clear as well. He says, there is no evidence that richer countries are happier than poorer ones 
so long as we confine ourselves to countries with income over 15,000. But even this $15,000 limit is being questioned by new studies. Victoria Reyes Garcia has surveyed about 7,000 rural low-income households, in, and she finds that their level of uh, subjective well-being resembles very much those of higher-income samples. And at the end, it turns out that income is one among many other factors that would boost subjective well-being, right? Such as autonomy or relationships or healthy environment. So in some growth is not good for the environment and it's got not good for long-term well-being. And so we need to replace these growth-driven economies with something else, something more sustainable, more egalitarian. And this is the degrowth project. It aims at shrinking unnecessary economic activity while reorganizing society around human and non-human flourishing. The metabolism of the world requires a radical resizing and reorganization. And instead of like growth-driven economies, we're looking for diversity of sustainable and egalitarian human economies. Serge Latouche, an influential French degrowth thinker, he characterized uh, degrowth with eight R's. He said degrowth is basically about, first of all, re-evaluating what is existentially important, reconceptualizing this classic dualism we, we use all the time and we take for granted, like backward, modern, developed, underdeveloped, and so on. And then restructuring society ar around these new values, redistributing wealth, relocalizing economies, reducing useless production and consumption, and then of course also reusing and recycling much more. So it's very important to realize that degrowth is not just about doing less of the same, right? Negative GDP uh, under capitalism would make no sense, and it has already a name. It's called a recession. It's an economic crisis. That's not what degrowth is looking for, of course. So degrowth is not about shrinking everything and just like imposing austerity everywhere. Some activities would definitely increase in a degrowth uh, society, like local products, urban gardens, and so on. It's just one label, degrowth, like for, in a way, societal healing. And as such, why would this only apply to the global north? But of course, it is the global north that should immediately and quite literally degrowth its unsustainable metabolism. It would be uh, a bit naive to assume that degrowth thinkers have only been uh, northerners. Gandhi himself was uh, in many ways much more radical than most contemporary Western degrowthers. Most of us who try to deal with the problem of poverty think only of a more intensive effort of production. We forget that it brings about a greater exhaustion of materials as well as humanity. Multiplying material wealth alone intensifies the inequality between those who have and those who have not. And it inflicts such deeper wound on the social system that the whole body eventually bleeds to death. Another Asian current of uh, degrowth kind of thinking would be Buddhist economics. And you can see on the table here, both approaches compared uh, Western, while Western economics would uh, seek to maximize profit, desire, instrumental use, self-interest, Buddhist economics would try to minimize suffering, minimize desire, instrumental use, and self-interest. Western economics would be about bigger is better, and Buddhist economics would be about small is beautiful and less is more. Okay, but let's try to become a little more concrete now, at the policy level, but also at the grassroots level. Focus on needs, not growth. The idea is simple, is like to boost undifferentiated growth. is certainly not the best way to fulfill true needs. What is needed, I think, is like a much more careful democratic planning, less market and less market only for those who can, who can afford it. So focus on needs and on care as well. Care has always been central to degrowth. And this brings degrowth and feminist perspectives close to each other as seen uh, in this quote here. Not only can a feminist perspective on care pave the way for degrowth, but also degrowth can pave the way for a caring economy. Redistribute, the wealth is already there. A good life, for all doesn't require a general increase in wealth necessarily, but a better distribution thereof. Always remember like the extent of inequality uh, 
in capitalist growth addicted economies. Like last year, there was 26 people who owned the same as the poorest half of humanity. So why would we grow? Why would we need to grow more, right? First of all, we need to redistribute better. Note also that like high growth rates are not necessarily good news for the poor. In India, for example, growth has been shown to help the rich and the middle class rather than the poor. It has to a large extent been jobless, especially in the countryside. It has also created new poverty. For example, when something free suddenly becomes privatized like water and suddenly you have to pay for it. And it also feeds on the poor. And here, uh, economist Jayati Ghosh made an interesting argument. She says that actually India's growth miracle couldn't take place without the poor. It needs the poor, right? Because the poor continually offers cheap arms and cheap lands. Cancel external debts and acknowledge the ecological debt. That really works as a powerful whip, forcing countries and companies to grow because of this pressure, right? And they have to grow at any social and ecological cost. So this is unfair and should definitely stop. But in parallel, industrial countries uh, owe a compensation in a way to other nations for, the, for all the ecological damage embodied in their own growth. And this is uh, called the ecological debt. And it starts also to put it at the forefront of the agenda. Stop extractivism. There's a movement called post-extractivism and it's very similar to degrowth in many ways and it calls for uh, putting an end to the dependency on extractive industries often controlled by a western capital extractivism is not the right way to make a country flourish five reorganize around other conceptions of the good life so not the mantras of working more earning more buying more right there is a need to go back to uh, the fundamental question, like what is important in our communities? Is it the decommodification of public services? Do we want organic food? Do we want more sustainability? And fortunately, we don't have to necessarily to start from scratch on those questions, right? There are many philosophies around the world that articulate what constitutes a good life. The way they do that is typically not aiming at endless growth which is only an aberration of Western capitalism, really. There is, for example, Buen Vivir, living well in the Andes, Ubuntu in Southern Africa. What can be learned from uh, three concrete examples uh, at the country level? Costa Rica. There was a, an indicator, the Happy Planets Index, that was proposed as an alternative to GDP, and they have their own measurements that they publish every year. This indicator looks at life expectancy, well-being, equality, and plots these against ecological impact. Well, almost every year, Costa Rica tops the global ranking. It outperforms the US with less than one-fifth of its GDP uh, per capita. So you can see that the GDP is by far not the food story. And even more interesting, the part of Costa Rica where people live the longest and happiest life turns out to be the Nicoya Peninsula, which is also poorest in terms of GDP per capita. So there's a lot to learn, but uh, I'm not saying here that Costa Rica is an example of degrowth, right? I'm just saying that very interesting things to observe out there in actually existing experiments. Cuba, have a quick look at this graph here. On this graph, you can see the Human Development Index, which is a slightly better indicator than GDP of many countries, and it's plotted against uh, their ecological footprints. And you can see that Cuba is the closest to the blue sustainability rectangle here, which means that uh, the, the countries that fall under this rectangle have a high HDI and a very low ecological footprint. And so Cuba managed to get very close to, uh, to that rectangle, which is quite a unique and remarkable achievement. Again, much to learn, I think, from this example. Finally, Bhutan. Bhutan is well known for trying to develop a new model of development. They officially seek sufficiency, so not endless growth. And the country put in place a number of very interesting policies, limiting growth, but boosting sustainability uh, and well-being. They have, for example, their own macroeconomic indicator, the Gross National Happiness Index. They limit foreign investments. They're not member of the World Trade Organization. They don't have outdoor advertising. They limit mass tourism, limit on minings. They have free education, free healthcare. They have half of their uh, surface that is uh, under protected areas and so on. So all of this is to uh, show you that 
a post-truth economy is not necessarily so far ahead or so utopian as it may seem at first. As a conclusion, I'd like to uh, come back to uh, the initial question I asked, right? Doesn't development require growth? Well, we saw that these five areas of interventions I briefly mentioned, right? They point towards more flourishing without growth addiction. So it's totally possible, I think. And uh, we saw that degrowth is not only uh, an invention of the so-called developed West. Vandana Shiva, for example, she's pretty clear, she says growth creates poverty. We saw that degrowth is not uh, a punishment, right? It's a project of societal healing. And as such, it applies more broadly under different labels. Finally, it should be evident by now that degrowth would have a lot to learn from uh, examples from the global South.